potato bowls. Wow. That's what I was looking for. Thank you, Rhino. Thanks. So this is going to be over there by the staircase. You are more than welcome. Oh, no. <laughs> you are more than welcome to sign up for something, anything. Every little bit helps so that we can all get together, break bread, and have a meal together. I also want to let you guys know something. Today is going to be the last day of all those beautiful colored clipboards. No, there are still more opportunities to sign up to serve within this awesome church body, okay? So please put your name, phone number down. I'll contact you, let you know the scoop. We can get to be really good friends, and you can find other ways to serve within this church. It's really exciting. If you have missed this opportunity today, don't fret. On the other side of that wall, there will be another sign-up, and you can do it at any point in time. So if God touches you and puts something on your heart like, hey, I think you need to be a part of that care team ministry, just let me know. I'll help you out, tell you where to go, give you the resources that you need. So last week, today, sign up. And just for those of you who would like to help participate, every little bit helps so that we can all eat and have full bellies before we start to worship the Lord. Okay? Thanks. All right. Well, hey, we are going to worship the Lord together this evening. And I don't know about you, but the Easter season is always an incredible season. Um, I love Easter. I love what it stands for, what it means, the fact that Jesus came to die on the cross for us, but he didn't just stay in the grave. He rose again so that we can face eternity with him, which is absolutely amazing. If you think about it, we are the only ones who serve a risen God right? The only ones who serve a risen God, everyone else serves a God who was alive a long time ago or did something a long time ago, but didn't come down and die on the cross and take away their sins. Doesn't have a intimate relationship with them the way that our God does. And so we have a lot to be thankful for, a lot to praise Jesus for. Um, we're going to start out tonight with a older song. It's actually a hymn. And it was actually chosen by Miss Hannah. Dun, da, da, da. Yay! Um, it's a great, a great Easter hymn. It's called "Because He Lives." Guys, ready? sent his son they called him jesus he came to love heal and forgive he bled and died to find my pardon an empty grave was there to prove my savior lived because he Life is worth the living just cause he lives. 
Sorrow and dead in my sin, lost without hope with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, ash was redeemed, only beauty remained. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to death. When death was arrested and my life began, oh, your grace so free washes.
darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with the freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washed you guys, but I'm starting to sweat up here. Oh, let. <clears throat> Man, there's nothing better than worshiping the Lord, is it? I tell you, um, you know, I didn't really, keep, really realize what it was that Jesus did for me on the cross until I was a senior in high school. Mm. And uh, <clears throat> I had been living for Jesus up to that point. It's not that I was rebellious. It's not that I hadn't gone to church. It's not that I hadn't met him before. I had seen him do incredible things, but you know, up to that point, I never really knew what it was that he went through on the cross for me. And it was a spring day just before Easter. In fact, it was the Monday before Good Friday. And I was driving home from school and you got to recognize that my school, I lived out in Illinois. We were 12 miles from the closest town. Our roads were straight. They were flat. Now, I could see a blinking light eight miles down the road from me. And as I'm driving home from school, before I knew it, I didn't even recognize why. But I slammed my foot down on the brake and my car slid to a stop and I jumped out of the car and as soon as I did, I was wondering, why am I here? Why did I stop? And I looked over in the cornfield and I saw a motorcycle on its side, still running. And as I started running over to that motorcycle, I saw the man who was driving it lying face down in the ditch. You know, I gave that man CPR, and he died right there in my arms. As a senior in high school, that wrecks you. I had never seen death face to face before that. You know, in scripture, and I, and I went to church that weekend, and they're talking about the death of Christ and the glorious death that he had for us. And, and what I had just experienced earlier that week was anything but glorious. And I recognized in that moment as a senior in high school that I had the Hollywood picture of what Jesus did for me. I had the Hollywood picture of a flippant death that was easy to go through that you turn off the TV and you forget about. But I can tell you that the death that Jesus went through on our behalf, and it was brutal. 
But the best part about it is that it wasn't final. You see, for us, when we hit that threshold of death here on this earth, it's our final days here. But for Jesus, he overcame that. That's right. You can be excited about that, right? He overcame death. He came back to life. And he has promised that he will come back again for us. What power, what mighty power does Jesus possess that he can overcome death itself? He can go to Hades and he can steal the keys. Mm -hmm. And the crazy thing about this God that we serve that's overcome death with all the power that he has, he has said to us that we can possess that same power if we follow in his footsteps. Let that sink in for a minute. If he overcame hell, if he overcame Satan, if he overcame death, then we have the power to do the same here. We don't have to let the enemy rule our lives. We don't have to listen to the lies that he throws our directions about who we are or who he thinks we are or who he wants us to believe that we are because Jesus says something different about us. You know what Jesus says? He says that you're more than conquerors. Jesus says things like, and this is crazy, because I read in scripture and I see the things that Jesus did. I saw the fact that he he spit in the dirt and healed a guy's eyes. The blind man saw again. The lame man walked again. The dead raised to life. More than once, he cast out demons of every kind. Scripture even says, Scripture even says that not all of the works of Jesus are recorded in this book. Right? So Jesus did an incredible amount of things, but there's a line in there where Jesus is talking to his followers and he says, You will do even greater things than I. What? That's crazy. Jesus has left us with all of the power that he possessed from the Father. If we could only grasp that, if I could only grasp that. Man, life would be different. And so we have all kinds of stuff to praise the Lord for, to be thankful for, and to cry out to Jesus about.
send his spirit down on us in such a way that it causes us to move that it causes us to do great things in his name that it causes us to be consumed by him so if you want that cry out to God tonight so fire fall down fire fall down on us we pray as we seek yes fire fall down fire fall down on us we pray as we seek yes fire fall down fire
seek is fire fall down fire fall down on us we pray as we seek yes fire fall down oh fire fall down on us we pray In Psalms chapter 63, verses 2 to 4, it says, So I am here in the place of worship, eyes open, drinking in your strength and your glory. In your generous love, I am really living at last. My lips brim praises like fountains. I bless you every time I take breath. My arms are like banners of praise to you. You know what that tells me? And the Bible says, this, my arms are like banners of praise to you. It's like, I can't stop waving my hands in the presence of God. I can't stop worshiping in the presence of God. I can't be at a place where I'm just, bleh. <laughs> For me, I think that this next song is going to be one that tells you, you know what, maybe I should lift up my hands to God. Maybe I should praise God. Maybe I should clap my hands because the Bible tells us to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And sometimes that's just me singing, but sometimes that's us clapping. That's us stomping our feet. That's us just calling out to God. So today, if you had a happy day and you accepted Jesus into your life, I challenge you. Praise the Lord. Greatest day in history. Death is beat, and you have rescued me. Sing it out, Jesus is alive. The empty tomb, the empty grave. Life eternal, you have won the day. Shout it out, Jesus is alive.
past became my prison Love was waiting with the key My story was my failure Now my story is redeemed oh, oh. My freedom's written in your nail-scarred hands Where there was sin and shame the cross now stands The grave no longer tells me who I am My freedom's written in your nail-scarred hands oh, oh. has paid my ransom Your wounds have made me whole Every day is brighter Your love is a miracle Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that you took our sin and our shame. Amen. And that our freedom is written in your nail scarred hands. You know, before, um, before we send the children to Children's Church, we're going to do something special here together. And, um, you know, Jesus commands us to do this in Scripture. There was a time when he was with his disciples and they were preparing for what was called the Passover feast. And the Passover was a time where they would remember 
what it was um, that God did for the Israelites when he brought them up out of Egypt. And if you remember, when they came up out of Egypt and Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he said no to Moses when he said, let my people go. And Pharaoh said, no way. God brought all these plagues upon Egypt. And the final plague that he brought upon Egypt was one where the firstborn son, the life of the firstborn son was taken from every family who did not have the blood of the lamb on the doorposts. God had told the Israelites, put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. And when the angel of death comes through, he will pass over you. Right? And so they called this, me this meal to celebrate this time, the Passover meal. And I want to read a passage to you out of John chapter 13. And this is where, where Jesus has in the upper room, he's with the, he's with the disciples. And it says, it was just before the Passover festival, and Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father, having <coughs> loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. And Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And if you continue reading on in John, you see that as Jesus gets to, to Peter, right? As Jesus gets to Peter, Peter says, No! Don't wash my feet. Because what you have to understand is that in that time and in that culture, Jesus was considered to be the rabbi. And the rabbi was called the teacher. And the teacher was one who would have servants who served him. And they would wash his feet as he came in the doors. And you know, they didn't have the luxury that we have today. They didn't have closed-toed shoes. They had sandals. They didn't have other luxuries called sidewalks or pavement. They had dirt streets. And they didn't have these luxuries that we call automobiles. They had horses or camels or donkeys. And I have a few horses of my own. And what happens if we live in Lancaster County? We see it all the time. What happens when a horse goes down the road? They leave evidence that they've been there. Right? And I'm sure that their feet were nasty. They were stinky. They were gross because of the things that they had been walking on. And most people in that day and age had servants who would wash the feet of the people who would come into their house. Jesus wasn't supposed to do that. Jesus was supposed to have his feet washed by everyone else. And so when he gets to Peter, Peter, he was the crazy one of the bunch. Everybody, every bunch has one, right? He was the crazy one of the bunch. And Jesus reaches out to wash his feet, and Peter says, no, don't touch my feet. And Jesus says, if you don't let me wash your feet, then you have nothing to do with me, Peter. And Peter's like, in that case, give me a bath, bro. And Jesus was like, yo, if you've had a bath, you're already clean. You don't need me. And Jesus was trying to set an example. And while he was there, he then went on after he washed their feet. He was with them, and Judas had left. And it says, while they were eating, Jesus took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, for this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I, want, I will not drink from the fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with my father in his kingdom. And so Jesus puts this, this example out for us to remember what he did for us. And there's nothing special about our saltine crackers. And there's nothing special about our grape juice that we have up here except for the fact that is a command that God has given us to do to remember him and remember what he has done for us. And so I'm just going to um, 
ask some of my leaders to come forward and help out. And we have two stations up here, one on either side. And I'm just going to ask you to come on forward when you're ready and grab the cup, grab the, the cracker, take it back to your seat, and just do a little business with God. Thank him for what he's done for you. You know, scripture also says that if you have something between you and your brother, you should leave it at the altar and go and make it right. And so take some time and say, Jesus, search me. Is there anything within me that would keep me from doing this? And, and, and if there is, then make it right. If there's not, we invite you to partake with us here this evening. This is open to anyone who has accepted Jesus as their Savior. We remember this together. We celebrate what God has done. So we're going to play a little bit of music here. And as the music is playing, I just encourage you to come on up and to, um, to partake or, or to grab the cup and grab the bread. And we'll take it together um, after everyone has gotten some. So feel free to come on up at any point. You know, Jesus took the bread and it said he broke and he gave thanks. And so, Jesus, we just thank you for the example that you gave us in Scripture. God, we praise you that you loved us so much that you were willing to go through the things that you went through in order to give us an opportunity to be with you. And, Lord, we thank you that your body was broken for us. We thank you that we didn't have to go through that because we couldn't redeem ourselves. Only you could. And so we thank you for all that you've done. We thank you for your body broken for us. Amen. So I just encourage you now to take the bread and remember what Jesus has done for us in his body being broken on our behalf. It says then he took the cup. And he gave thanks. And so, God, we thank you for your blood poured out for us. We thank you that your blood has, has cleansed us from all our iniquities, from all unrighteousness. And, God, we thank you that you gave us an opportunity 
to be able to enter into the Holy of Holies, to be in your presence. And Lord, I pray that we would not take that lightly. I pray that we would come before you and allow the blood of your sacrifice to wash over us and make us whole and clean. It's in your name. Amen. He said, drink and remember what I've done. So we get to do this every so often at the living room just to remember what Jesus has done for us. And, and I don't know about you, but for me, it's a special time to remember what God has done and to, to, to take communion together as brothers and sisters and to be able to experience that um, with one another and not just on our own. And so, um, yeah, thank you for being a part of that with us tonight. I'm going to go ahead and dismiss the children. You guys are welcome to head on off to Children's Church. And as they're headed back, you know, I'll just let you know if you haven't been with us at the living room before, this is kind of a fun time. We get to go through some scriptures and we get to go through some um, questions together at our tables where we have some conversation um, and so we're going to move into that time. When we come back, we are starting a brand new series tonight. It's called Real Love. And this one is A Love to Die For. And, um, you know, as we go through this series, you guys get the privilege, or I don't know, maybe you're in trouble, one of the two. Um, tonight, Seppi and I are both going to be preaching when we come back up here. Um, we're going to tag team it together. Um, and so, you know, you can use this time to prepare yourself for that. Um, say a prayer or two if you need to. Uh, but no, God really wants to meet us here in this place. I'm excited about this series. We're actually going to hear from Micah next week. Micah is going to be preaching to us next week. Um, it's going to be some cool stuff. So you can pray for him. Pray for him this week as if you think about it as he prepares uh, to, to bring the word to us next week. But um, we also believe that, that God speaks through each and every one of us, not just through the people that are up here on stage. And so that's why we have this time together to go through scripture together and to, to hear from each and every one of you. And so as we go through these questions and these scriptures, um, we're going to move through them somewhat quickly tonight. Um, but as we go through them, I just encourage you to, to speak out whatever God has put on your heart because he's put it on your heart for a reason. So, all right, I'm going to sit down and Seppi and I will be back up in a little bit.
All right. Well, hey, I think this topic of real love we could probably talk about forever. Um, we probably have our, our definitions of what love is. And, you know, we asked the question in there, what is the difference between the biblical, um, the biblical standard of love and the worldly perspective of love? And, you know, I don't think the American language does us any good when it comes to this word. Right? Because how many of you guys in here love hamburgers? Yeah, how many of you guys, I, I know I'm probably the only one here, but how many of you love cosmic brownies? Yeah, I'm a cosmic brownie freak. Yeah, <laughs> that's all right, haters can hate. But, um, <laughs> but uh, we use the same word to love food that we do to say we love our wife, right? Now, I hope, I hope 
that we don't have the same love for a hamburger that we have for the people around us. Some of us say, I love hamburgers more than I love the people around us, right? <laughs> Mariana's saying, it's not a lie. <laughs> but um, this word love, this word love is one of those things that really, it, it takes on a whole bunch of different meanings for us in our language. But one of the things that we really want to talk about is, is a true love um, that God shows us. There's a quote that says, people are not looking for something to live for. They're looking for something to die for. For once you find something worth dying for, you have finally found something worth living for. Mm. Right? I think there's a lot of truth in that quote. I, I, I actually got, read that quote, and I was like, oh, man, it hit me right here. Because I was like, you know, the, I don't want to just live my life for something that is fleeting and can can, can pass with a moment. I want to live my life for something that I'm willing to give my life for. Right? And Jesus, Jesus thought you were worth dying for. And he gave up his life for you. And so if you are worth dying for, and Jesus thought that you were worth dying for, how much more should we see that Jesus is worth dying for and the cause of Christ is, is worth dying for. And so therefore, if it's worth dying for, then it's worth giving up our life for now. It's worth living for him now. It's worth changing our perspectives and changing the things we do in order to live for him in such a way that we would be willing to die for him. And this, this quote for me, it, it means something more because... So when you find something you're willing to, to die for, then you can live for it. And in, in preparing your heart alone to, 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 to be ready to, to die, okay? And now for us, in all essentiality, for us, the living, dying is unknown. But there's a faith behind us that tells us that we have lived, we're, we're going to live on. There's a faith that says to me that after this life, there's going to be a next one that was promised to me so that I'm willing to die for that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm willing to die for that. But in that love, in that same love that was shown to me, I also want to show you that same love. I desire in myself to show you that kind of same love so that if you'd never experienced it, if you've never had it, if you don't know it, then maybe you might catch a glimpse of it and wonder what it is, what it means, and how can I have it. So if I'm willing to die for this thing, that means I should be willing to live for it. That means that when the time comes and I'm pressed whether to, I should fall away from this thing that says I have, after, I have life after death or chase after it, I'm, I'm chasing. I'm chasing. Because if I'm chasing, I know that I'm chasing life and not death. Because once I do pass, there's another life behind it. And it doesn't, it doesn't end the way this one does with pain and suffering and sickness. It ends with eternal life at the foot of the cross or at the foot of the throne of Jesus Christ where I can praise and worship him for saving my soul. So one of the verses that we read, and Jesus, Jesus had it down pat. He had it figured out, this whole true love, this whole real love thing. He had it figured out for us. And, and the verse that we read came out of Romans chapter 10, verse 12, where it says, Greater love has no one than this, than one laid down his life for his friends. Mm -hmm. Right? Jesus not only laid down his life for his friends, but he laid down his life for those who hated him. Right? I mean, how many of you, how many of you in here can think of somebody who just grates on you? Like, mm. you have somebody in your life who you just maybe wish they weren't in your life. <laughs> right? How many of you would be able to say, I would die for them? Right? Right? How many of you have family that you absolutely love, that you adore them, 
right? That, 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 that you would spend every waking moment with them. You, you enjoy being around them. How many of you would say, I would die for them? Mm. Right? It's one thing to die for family and friends, to die for those, put your life in a place. And I can tell you that you mess with my family, you're going to mess with me. Well, right? Preach. You mess with my family, you're going to mess with me. And I will put myself in harm's way to protect my family, even if that's the cost of my life. I don't know that I'd do that for everybody. There's some people I could probably think of that maybe I would have to think twice about it. I might push them in front of the bus. Right? (laughs) 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 Might send them to see Jesus. Right? But Jesus, Jesus was willing to lay down his life for us even before we were considered him a friend. That's crazy to think about. And so as we look at it, and even when we read... Um, even when we read in, in John, in John, the, uh, the, the, the story of Jesus coming and being with his disciples and, and, and having the last supper together, there's a few things in those passages that I think that we can learn from the life of Jesus to help us see what real love is. And the first thing that I think that we can learn from the life of Jesus is that real love requires service. Real love requires service. It requires us to serve one another. It requires us to get down and dirty. It requires us to to, to do something for someone else, not simply for ourselves. Hmm. See, in in, in service, love, and I use this example. I said, when I'm with my wife at home, she'll bring me a plate of food. That's service. Okay, I love food. When... I'm downstairs, or I'm upstairs, and she's downstairs. Hey, baby, do you want me to get you breakfast ready? Sure, honey. Absolutely. Can I start your car for you? while This service, because I want my wife to experience, I want her to know that I'm thinking of her. I want her to know that her, her feelings, that her emotions, and what she is dealing with matter to me. And that's all from service, because if I can serve her, if I can wash her feet, if you will. See, I'll put it to you this way. Back then, they walked through a lot of crap. Literally. Literally. (laughs) They had their shoes that were open-toed, and as they walked through all this mess, Jesus got down on a knee as the greatest servant of all, got down on his knees and began to wash the disciples' feet to wash the mess off of them. And as an act of service, we have to learn to do the same thing. And sometimes we struggle doing that, and we're talking about real love here. Now, when we struggle with doing that to our brother and sister, we struggle with serving them. We forget that there was a Judas in the midst of the 12. Jesus washed Judas's feet as well. He got down and washed his feet right before he betrayed him. But what did Jesus do? He didn't didn't clown him at that point in time. He didn't even tell him, you know, put him out on Front Street when he went to kiss him. And I don't kiss me, you traitor. You're fake. You're a faker. Don't come and try and kiss me and tell me that you love me. No, he kissed him and whispered in his ear, go ahead and do what you're going to do. I know where you're headed. Right after he washed his feet. Right after the king of kings and lord of lords washed, got down on one knee and washed his feet, he betrayed him and walked away. That service. And you and I, as Christians, as believers in the most high God and believers of Jesus Christ, we have to serve in that same capacity. In that same manner, when somebody's about to betray us, when somebody's about to turn us over and and just 
put our business on Front Street. What do you do? Can I offer to cook you dinner? How can I help you? Do you need me to help you fix your car? Can I drive you somewhere? I know you were talking about me yesterday, but I'm going to show you how much I love you today. That's a sacrificial love. That's a service that shows love. I think that our culture will try to tell us that once we attain a certain level of um, success or a certain level of, of, of prominence that we no longer have to do certain things, hmm. right? So if we're the boss in the company, then we aren't the ones scrubbing toilets, right? You know, we got, we're past that. We no longer have to do that. When we get to a, when we have, quote unquote, seniority, right? When we have seniority, that means we don't have to do certain things anymore. Let the new guy handle that one. It's called initiation, mm -hmm. right? But man, that's not what Jesus showed us. That's not Jesus, what Jesus was saying. And, and, and I have this thing, and I try to model this to my kids, and I try to model this here at church, is that I, I hope and I try really hard to live by the fact that I will never ask anyone to do anything that I'm not willing to do myself. Doesn't mean I have to always do it, but if I'm not willing to do it, I'm not going to ask you to do it. You know, the crazy thing that the, the crazy thing is that the reason I even became a pastor in the first place was because I was doing the things that nobody else wanted to do. I was going to a church right down the road here, and my first introduction to that church was they needed somebody to wash toilets and fold bulletins. So that's what I did. For 12 weeks, I went in and I scrubbed toilets and I folded bulletins. They had just hired a youth pastor. They didn't need a youth pastor. In fact, the first day I was at their church, they hired a brand new youth pastor. And so I walked into there and I was like, I have the schooling for it. I have the calling for it. But I need to prove myself first. And I need to be willing to do things that nobody else is doing right now but the church needs in the moment and if that's scrubbing toilets and folding bulletins then by all means that's what I'm gonna do and so that's what I did and what what happened when I was in there scrubbing toilets and folding bulletins I I, I came in and, and because of where I was at with work and and <clears throat> I had fallen off a roof and I couldn't do a whole lot of stuff but I could scrub toilets and I could fold bulletins so I was going in during the day and I was spending a lot of the day there and and the pastor would come out and he would ask me questions and then he would ask me, why are you here? And I would tell him why I was there. And then he got to know me a little bit more and he asked me what my heart was and what were my dreams in life. And I told him all about what I wanted to do and where I felt like God was calling me. So when a vacancy came up and the youth pastor that had been there left, who do you think the first one they called on was? Me. Why? Because I showed that I was willing to serve and do what was needed, not just what I wanted. And I think that, that what Jesus is saying, and he says in Scripture numerous times, you know, if you want to be the greatest, then you must be the servant of all. That's my paraphrase, right? Then you must be the servant of all. We need to prove that we're willing to do the things that nobody else is willing to do to serve those around us, even if it's not where we want to end up. I think that another example of what Jesus shows us that we can follow for him is that real love requires sacrifice. Real love requires sacrifice. See, sacrifice is something that you have to give up to of yourself. And, and Colleen over in our group made a great point. She said, you know, I came to Jesus and there's things that I just wanted to give up. There's things that I wanted to let go of because I knew they weren't things that, that were benefiting me. They didn't help me get any closer to God, so I wanted to give them up. And she was like, yeah, well, is that sacrifice? Yes? No? So I say sacrifice is something that costs us because the word sacrifice means giving up. And back in the day when you brought a sacrifice to 
to, to, uh, to the temple, what you did was you raised something to a certain standard and then gave it to the church. Or if you did not have that ability to raise the animal that was needed for sacrifice, then you had to go and buy one with the money that you worked for from your own pocket so that you could buy that sacrifice and then put it forward. And in order for you to have a sacrifice, you had to put work in. So I can't give anything up that doesn't require work. If it requires work, then it's a sacrifice. No, that's why the Bible tells us to give tithe. That's why it tells us to give offering. That's why it tells us that we should serve one another. And it's not easy. It's hard. Sometimes it's sacrifice because I want to go to bed, but I got to stay up with people. Sometimes I want to go to bed, and I got to be up on the phone talking to people. Sometimes I want to, I want to go play golf, and I got to help somebody fix their car. You know, so it's sacrifice of the things that I want and I desire to give to someone else. It's sacrificial. Love is sacrificial. You give of yourself. Have you ever heard the saying, my grandfather used to say this one to me, a penny found is a penny spent, but a penny earned is a penny saved. Have you ever heard that one before? A penny found is a penny spent, but a penny earned is a penny saved. And what I think is meant by that is that if you don't sacrifice anything to get it, then it goes out of your hands really quick. Mm -hmm. But if you had to work for it, if you had to sacrifice something in order to attain it, then you're careful with what you do with it, right? And I think love is the same way. Have you heard the saying, if you can fall into love, you can fall out of love? Mm. Yeah. What that means there too is that if it comes easily, it goes easily. And I think the same is true in our relationship with Jesus and with real love is that if we just kind of flippantly walk into it, we flippantly walk out of it. But if we sacrifice something in order to attain it, then we are going to cherish it because we know what it took to get it. And so this whole idea of real love requires sacrifice. I mean, Jesus gave the ultimate sacrifice. He gave his life for us to show us how much he loved us. But I think what he's asking us, asking of us for him in return is not that we lay down our physical life, but that we lay down and give our life over to him. And we follow his commands. I mean, numerous times in scripture, he says, those who love me, obey my commands. Those who love me, let me put that in, in, in our terms. Those who love me will do what I ask. Those who love me will do what they know I like. Those who love me will follow me wherever I go. Those who love me will do the things that I have said are good to do. And so the whole idea of real love meaning needing sacrifice means that it's not something we just fall into. It's not something that's just easy. It might be easy to attain, but in order to hold on to it, we've got to work for it. And when I don't mean works as in we have to do all the right things, but what I mean by that is that we need to be willing to sacrifice on the behalf of Christ. That we need to be willing to let go of things. It's kind of like when you came to the altar or when I came to the altar with my wife, and I know that things are changing very rapidly in our culture, but when I came to the altar with my wife and I gave my vows and I said, forsaking all others, right? Forsaking all others. I commit myself to you. And what I meant when I said that is I'm not going to give the same level of intimacy to other people that I give to you. And I'm not going to have the same relationship with other women that I have with my wife. And the same is true when it comes to our relationship with Jesus. When it comes to that, he wants to know that he is number one for us. You know, doesn't he say that he's a jealous God? Doesn't he say that we shall have no other gods before him? Right? And so when we step into relationship with Jesus, one of the things that we're sacrificing is the desires of our heart to fall after, follow after the things of this world. And when I say the things of this world, what I mean by that is, is to follow after the things that are 
we know are not good for us, the things that we know are what, not what Jesus is asking of us, the things that, that cause us not to live by the standard of the Bible. Those are the things that we have to sacrifice in order to follow the Lord. And you know, the interesting thing about it is that the more you're in relationship with God, just like the more I'm in relationship with my wife, the more it doesn't feel like a sacrifice because her desires become my desires and my desires become her desires and I want to see her happy and so therefore the things that make her happy make me happy. And the same is true in our walk with Jesus is that it comes to a point that when we've been walking with him and we've sacrificed these things that the things that make him happy, the things that he desires become our desires. And you know, scripture says that he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, when he says that, he, pre, he, he, he precludes that basically by setting the stage saying that when you're close to me, your desires will, or my desires will become your desires. And so therefore, if they line up with my word, your desires, I will give to you because they line up with my desires too. And so God will give us the desires of our heart when we sacrifice the desires of the world. Wow. When you sacrifice yourself of yourself and you give sacrifice. You know, and real love requires a commitment. It does. It does. Real love requires for us to be committed to the one that we love. Real love requires me to love you when you don't even love yourself. Real love is going to require me to care for you when I can't stand you. <laughs> Let's be real. Let's be real. I don't have to like you to love you. But I'm going to love you till you believe it. I'm going to love you till you believe it. I, I, I may not be able to hold conversation with you, but I'm going to love you. I'm going to help you fix your car. I'm going to help you change your flat tire. You, you, you're hurt, and I'm going to bring you some meals. I'm going to show you that I love you until you understand what love is. Not because I'm showing you love. It's because Christ loved me first, and I have to show you what he showed me. That commitment that he made to me, I can't deny it. The commitment that he made to me when he died on the cross, I can't look back at that and say, I can't love you because the Bible says, what is the greatest commandment? He asked, they asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And then they said, teacher, what is the next one? Love your neighbor as yourself. Man, that takes commitment. It takes commitment because sometimes I don't want to love my neighbor. Sometimes I don't want to love my neighbor, but I'm going to. That commitment that I have to show you love is the same commitment that Jesus gave me. Because if I don't show you that commitment, you're not going to see the Jesus in me. And you're going to look at it. If that's what the Christian is, is that what a Christian is like? Is that how Christians act? No. I don't want you to see that. I want you to see the same love that I'd experienced. I want you to see the same love that I was shown when I came to the foot of the cross. That when I was hurting and in my addiction to relationship and my addiction to being having to be with people all the time. And then it, that God broke that addiction because he sent a brother to my house and, and we kneeled on the floor in my living room to pray for God to break that thing off of me and it was broken and that's the same love that I'm willing to show you because it's a commitment that I have that was shown to me first and that commitment was on the cross are you ready to be committed as well be devoted to one another in love honor one another above yourselves this is a really foreign concept to honor one another above yourselves. You know, I keep going back to the whole idea of marriage, but I can tell you for me personally, I didn't realize how selfish I was until I got married. 
right? And what I mean by that is I didn't realize how often I thought about myself until I had to think about someone else. And, <clears throat> you know, it was hard to break that. And, and, I, and I still struggle with that. I've been married for almost 24 years now. And, and I still have to put my wife's desire above my own sometimes. And it still doesn't come naturally, and I have to work at it, right? Why? Because we want what we want, and we want it now. It's called the McDonald's culture, mm. right? That's what we're taught. We're taught that you don't have to pay for it now. Get it now. Pay for it later. That's the whole thing of with credit cards and, and debt and all of that. We don't have to wait for it, man. We can get it now. <sighs> But man, what does that breed in us? That breeds a desire for us to have what we want. That breeds of what, what I call entitlement. That says you have to give to me and it's okay. You know, I'm just going to say this out loud. If you know me, you already know this. But my biggest pet peeve in the world is when somebody expects something from me or expects me to do something that they're not willing to do for themselves. Or for anyone else. <laughs> Whoo, that drives me nuts. Right? I can't stand that. Yet how often do I do that? Ouch. Because I want something or I think I should have something or, whoo, I just, I just deserve this. Have you ever told yourself, man, I deserve this. I have worked hard. I just deserve this. You know, I was fighting with it, and this sounds really funny, but I was fighting with it, and I haven't even told my wife this one yet, so if something comes flying at me from that side of the room, it was <laughs> not her. But, um, you know, I, I've been in a season where I've just been working a lot. You know, I come here, and I do church stuff, and then I go, and I work on the building over there, and then I have two businesses, and so in those two businesses, I pour all kinds of time into them. And so it's not uncommon in this season right now for me to be working until 1, 2, sometimes 3 in the morning. And then I get up again for a meeting at 6, right? And so every once in a while, there comes this time where I don't have a meeting in the morning. But I have these things in my house called children. Mm. Right, and, and every one of my children is at this, this stage in their life where they go to this thing called school. Mm. Right? And school starts at what time? We'll just say early. Mm. School starts early, and all of my kids get up early to go to school. And there are times where I go to bed at night at 3 in the morning, and I'm thinking, oh, it would be so nice to sleep in tomorrow morning. I have no meetings. And then my alarm clock goes off, and Janina begins to wake up, and I think, maybe if I just lay still enough, <laughs> she'll just let me sleep. <clears throat> right? <laughs> but on top of that, I also know mornings at my house can sometimes be what the word we would call chaos. Mm. Right? Because lunches need to be packed, and I only have a few more than one child, um, seven exactly. Um, and so it can be chaos. And I think in my mind, oh, I know that it would seriously be a blessing for me to just suck it up and get up and serve my wife. And even if it's just, in her terminology, moral support, it's better than me being in bed. And so sometimes I have to push through that, and it sounds like something really small, but you know, even in our spiritual lives, we have those things sometimes where we just want to be lazy. Mm. How many of you guys have ever wanted to be lazy in your spiritual life? Oh, yeah. Or just at a place of being like, you know what, God, I worked really hard this week. Everything I did was for the church. So you could just give me a day off, Right. I don't have to do my spiritual disciplines today because I can do them tomorrow. Right? Have you ever been there? But man, this whole thing of real love means that you need to have a sacrificial 
commitment, sometimes it has to, you have to push through those feelings. You have to push through those things. And you have to force yourself to do it. You know, Paul, I love Paul. Paul is my f- favorite writer in the Bible. And he says really practical things sometimes. He says things, and I know that I've, I've used this scripture before, so it's not going to be new to some of you. And, I, and, I, and, and my kids are like, Dad, really seriously, you're using this one again? Because I use this one for them all the time. And that's when, when Paul says, I beat my body to make it obedient to the things of Christ. Mm-hmm. Right? And so what that means is that we can force ourselves. We can tell our bodies what to do. We can tell ourselves what to do. We are not slaves to our desires. We are not slaves to our bodies. We are not slaves to our circumstances. We can tell ourselves what to do, and we can will ourselves to do it. Right? And sometimes that's what real love looks like. Sometimes you need to show somebody you love them when everything inside of you is saying, but I just want to feel it first. If you wait to feel it first, you ain't going to have a very good relationship. Because I'm telling you that when you show love, nine times out of ten, you're shown love. How easy is it for you to love somebody who loves you back? How easy is it to love someone who loved you first? It's a lot easier than loving someone who you feel like should be doing something for you. Right? But you know what? Real love, real love requires for us to give sacrificial commitment. Selfless commitment. Meaning we're putting other people's desires and needs above our own. Not that we deny ourselves all the time. Not that we don't take care of ourselves. That's a whole nother sermon. But that we are willing to show someone else that they're worth it before they show it to us. I'm going to read uh, Romans 8. 35 to 39, it says, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungered or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As scripture says, for we For your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Now, here's my my jam right here. Here's my jam. It says, I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or earth below, indeed nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Jesus Christ our Lord. Now let me break it down for you. You can't run from God's love. You can't get away from it. There's no way, shape, or form, or manner that you could ever do something that would pull you away from God's love. Nothing. Nothing. God loves you so much that even in your failure, He knew what you were going to do. He knew you were going to fail. He knew you were going to have sex before marriage. He knew you were going to do drugs. He knew where you were going to fall into adultery. He knew you were going to fornicate. He knew all the, you list the sins in the Bible. He knew you were going to do them before you did them. And he still said, I love you and went to the cross. He still said, I love you. I'm going to shed my blood for you on the cross. That's the beauty of the love of Jesus Christ, that you can't run from it. 
You can't run from it. He loves you that much. And I know because I was on the other side. I was on the other side and I didn't know. I knew about Jesus. I grew up in the church. I got little stars and stickers and those little foil stars they'd give you for bringing your Bible and your offering. I got those. And I knew the verses, but I didn't know Jesus. And when I came to know him, I realized my faults. I realized my failures. I realized all the things that I was doing wrong. And guess what? He loved me anyway. And when I understood that love, when I came to realize that love, that's when I broke. That's when I said, God, you love me this much. I don't have a choice. I don't have a choice but to be committed to you. I don't have a choice but to serve you. I don't have a choice but to sacrifice everything for your cause and for your purpose. I don't have a choice. My heart won't let me do anything else. So now, when you have the opportunity to serve God, do you have the opportunity to give him wholeheartedly what he asks of you? No matter what you've done, no matter what you experience, what you think you can do to get away from God, God's love, you can't do it. You can't do it. It is impossible. Now, if you don't, hey, you're going to reap the consequences. But now, that's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is God's love for you. And he loves you so much, so much, that he's still waiting for you. Because if you have breath, you have opportunity. If you can do this, you have opportunity. If you're looking at me this morning, this, this morning, if you're watching online, they might be on the other side of the world. If you're looking at me this evening, you have opportunity to accept Jesus into your life. You have opportunity for him to heal you. You have opportunity for him to set you free no matter what you're dealing with. You have opportunity for that shame and that guilt to be removed from you. In the name of Jesus Christ, it can be removed. And God can heal you. No questions asked. God can heal you. He can wash you clean of anything you thought you did and anything you think you can do. He, that dead person in you, He can resurrect That power, that, that same power, the same power that brought him out of that tomb can resurrect the life that he has for you. That same power can resurrect the dead parts of you that the devil has kept down and he can bring them back in the name of Jesus. He can bring them back. He's a redeemer. He's a healer. He has the ability to set you free from everything. Sometimes, sometimes we're only captive in our minds. And the only thing that has us captive is a thought that he won't and he can't. In the name of Jesus Christ, that is a lie. And I call it out what it is. It's a lie. Because he can and he will. And he did it before and he'll do it again. If you want that opportunity, I give two options. I'll give you two options today. Two options. Come to the front and we'll pray with you. Come to the front and we'll, we will pray for you. Because salvation is so good. Now, I didn't say it's easy, but I said it's good. I didn't say it is easy, but I said it's good. My wife made banana bread the other day. I watched her sit and whip bananas and mess with dough and put everything together. And all she had made was this little pan like this. I said, oh, no, 
I'm going to go buy it. But I tell you what, when I cut it up and I had that piece, it was so good and worth it. I tasted the goodness of the work that she put in. God did all the work on the cross. He's asking you to come and taste it. The Bible says come and taste and see that the Lord is good. Come and taste and see that the Lord is good. That's all he wants from you. Just taste it because you're going to want more and more and more and more. Come and taste. See that the Lord is good. Again, I tell you, I'm going to give you two opportunities. Come to the front and pray. And we'll pray with you. We'll pray for you. It doesn't matter. We'll pray. And if you don't want that, you don't want to come up to the front, fine, cool. Don't worry about coming to the front. Find us afterwards and we'll pray with you. We'll take you to the back and we'll pray with you. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be a show. But I want you to know that we are available to pray for you. We are available to pray with you. And if you're struggling with something, we can pray it off with you in the name of Jesus. It doesn't matter. And I tell you what, in the name of Jesus, spirit of fear, shut up right now because it has no place here. You can't be scared. You can't be scared. Scared of what? You already have the victory when you come to the cross. You already have the victory when Jesus died for you. As soon as you accepted that victory is yours in the name of Jesus. So as Pastor Dave plays the song and we finish out, I'm going to give you opportunity to come forward so we can pray for you. We have Mariana and uh, Janina that can play, pray with the women. And Dave, myself, and Eric will pray for the men. But you are more than willing to come forward and we will pray with you. And Mike.
freedom is written in the nail-scarred hands of Jesus Christ, who came to earth as a child, lived a perfect life, and sacrificed himself for us in a real love where he found you worth dying for. Amen. Amen. Well, you all are dismissed. You know, I pray that God works in your life in incredible ways this week. And I would just encourage you to keep an eye out for what he's doing. Because when you keep an eye out for what he's doing, you recognize what he's up to. And when you recognize what he's up to, you can join him in it. And when you join him in it, you see miraculous things happen. So keep an eye out for it because he's on the move and he wants to work in, through, and with you. Amen? Amen. Y'all are dismissed. This week. This week. This week.